last video we discussed the difference between an observational study and a designed experiment and we want to talk about this a bit more because the difference really matters a lot. So observational study is when the researcher is just observing what's happening or um, surveying people and asking them questions or getting records, um, just watching what occurs in certain situations, that kind of thing. That's observational. The design experiment is when the researcher is influencing the explanatory variables to see if they can affect a change in the response variable. And that word effect matters. <laughs> so observational studies, it, let's say you see some type of relationship, but the observational study can only discuss it as a relationship. So for example, Let's say that when students walk in to take their final exam, you as an instructor can observe that some students brought granola bars and things for them to munch on and eat while they're taking the exam and other students did not. So, and then you record that and then you also notice that students that had food, for example, scored higher on that final exam. But all we can talk about is the fact that food seems to have a relationship with score on the final exam. If students have food, then they score better on the final exam. But we can't say that the food is causing the higher final exam score because there are other things that could be affecting what's going on. And we're going to talk about this down here called confounding variables, lurking variables, etc. So the observational study, the, the professor is just seeing who's eating and seeing who's not, and then recording that, and then recording exam scores, and saying, hey, students that brought some food, they scored higher. That's an interesting relationship. But I can't say that this food caused the higher exam score. And the reason is that it's not a designed experiment. The, the researcher, the instructor, did not give the food to certain students and not to others. That's what it would take to be a designed experiment. Let's say as the students randomly walk into the exam, students are randomly assigned an apple or nothing, right? You're told you can eat this apple during the exam, or you will eat this example during the exam, and other students are said, no, you will not eat during the exam. So the research is influencing what they can do during the exam, and then we would see how they score. And if the apple students score better than the nothing students, then we can start making a call out a cause and effect claim and saying, hey, students that, that eat an apple, they scored higher. So it appears that eating an apple causes students to score higher. But that can only happen if the researcher influenced, gave the apples out randomly to the students, recorded the exam scores, etc. So those are two very different relationships because in an observational study, if students are just eating food of their own accord, then maybe those students know themselves better. Maybe they're more introspective. Maybe they're better studiers as a result because they know they need food during an exam. They recognize that about themselves. They might also recognize better how to study. They know better how to look at themselves and figure out what they need and what they don't need in an exam and also what they need and don't need when they study. So maybe you're just catching that relationship of more introspective students. That is called a lurking variable. <laughs> so a lurking variable is an explanatory variable that was not considered in the study, but that affects the value of the response variable. In addition, lurking variables are typically related to explanatory variables considered in the study. Right? So how introspective a student is might affect whether they bring food in and might affect their score on an exam. And that's a really hard thing to control for. Um, this presents big problems for um, psychology studies, sociology studies, you know, people just are certain ways and it's very difficult to get at that and to t separate that out um, in an observational study. But I've, I've put the cart before the horse a little bit, so let's go back and talk about confounding. Confounding occurs when the effects of two or more explanatory variables cannot be separated. So there are lots of things that influence how you score on a test. All the things that influence that are explanatory variables. And the confounding is the fact that there's relationships between these things. You know, how introspective you are, how much you studied, how much you ate, how much you slept. All of those things are, are confounding the situation, making it difficult for us to figure out how you can score higher on a final exam. Because that's the response where we want to score higher on final exams. How can we do it? Well, there's so many different factors, and all of those different factors are at play with each other. That's confounding. It's saying there's a mess going on here. And what it's, and researchers try to do is they try to tease out that mess and figure out, hey, what can I see is really having some kind of relationship if it's something I cannot affect. Let's say how much the students slept the week going up to the exam. 
I'm never going to be able to control that and influence um, people to to be different. So that's I'm only going to be able to talk about relationships. It appears that students that slept more in the week going up to the exam scored higher. But I can only talk about it in those terms, the relationship. Now, if I force students to sleep or I force students to stay awake, that's more a causal effect. I can affect what's going on as a researcher, and therefore I can say, hey, if I force students to not sleep, if I force them to stay awake, they scored worse on the exam, then I'm showing that there's some kind of cause-effect relationship. All right, so confounding is just that there are lots of variables that would influence your response variable. Um, and we've got to try to account for those things in various ways. Now, lurking variables are confounding variables that we were, excuse me, lurking variables are explanatory variables that were not considered in our study, but that do affect the value of the response variable. So for example, my level of introspection for a student, that would be a lurking variable. A confounding variable is an explanatory variable that was considered in the study whose effect cannot be distinguished from a second explanatory variable in the study. So for example, let's say, go back to my apple and no apple for the final exam. So let's say I further say, apple students, I'm going to randomly place you through the room, and non-apple students, I'm going to randomly place you through the room. So that way I know that I've gotten rid of placement in the room for where you take the exam as a confounding variable. Because where you sit to take an exam might have an effect on how you score on that exam. So that's a confounding variable that I can control for. But a lurking variable is an explanatory variable that I cannot control for. So, for example, how much sleep the student had for the week leading up to the exam. How much the student studied, how many hours the student studied for the week leading up to the exam. Those might have a great effect on the final exam score, but I have no way to influence that as a researcher. So therefore, it's a lurking variable. It's something else going on that I cannot have any influence over. All right, so both confounding variables and lurking variables are explanatory variables that can affect the situation. Lurking variables are ones that I could not account for in my study. Confounding variables are ones that I can account for in my study and try to mitigate the factors of. So, and I wrote that right here. Confounding variables are measured in the study, but lurking variables are not. Another confounding variable might be biological sex. So I could record um, the biological sex of the people that are taking the exam. So perhaps women score higher on this exam than men or something like that. So I could measure those variables. I could write down the biological sex of each student and I could see did that have an effect in what was going on or not. So I could I can measure that, but how much the student studied, which is lurking, I cannot um, influence or measure. All right, a placebo is a neutral treatment that has no effect on the response variables. So that would be um, a sugar pill, for example, or a false treatment. Sometimes they'll do uh, fake surgeries and real surgeries. So they'll, um, or fake acupuncture and real acupuncture. Or they'll do it one way versus um, a fake way. But the person doesn't know that it's fake, for example. So that's a placebo. It's a neutral treatment. Um, sugar pills, technically, they don't like making them out of sugar because sugar might have an effect on your metabolism. They try to make them completely inert, something that has no effect on you whatsoever. So that's a placebo, right? So placebo is a neutral treatment. Um, the easiest way to imagine this is with drug testing, but they do um, sham all sorts of things if you research placebo. Now, placebo effect is when your subject responds because they received a treatment even if that treatment was a placebo. So uh, the person says, yes, I'm feeling much better, doctor, but the doctor only gave them an inert pill that did nothing. But they still felt better. And that's a psychological effect that we are still trying to get our hands around why that is going. That way, there's lots of psychological studies on what the placebo effect is, how can it work better, et cetera. Because when you think about it, it the person, if the person gets the benefit without having to take the high-powered drugs or whatever it might be, then that would be a great thing. If we could harness whatever it is the brain is doing to make the person feel better without actually having to have this you know, terrible treatment, say, then that would be wonderful. So placebo effect is a, is a very hot topic in research right now. Now a control group. A control group is a group that receives a baseline treatment. Now, it's often placebo, so for example, um, or nothing, 
So for example, in the final exam example that I gave, Apple would be the treatment, nothing would be the control group, right? So the group that got nothing, they're the control group. Or um, if you're in a medical study, let's say you're getting a shot every week and you don't know if your shot is the actual drug or if the shot is a placebo. So then that um, a, a shot full of nothing that is going to help you saline, for example. Then that placebo group, the group that's getting the shot that's nothing, they're the control group. Um, now, sometimes it's unethical to give them nothing or placebo because it, what they're dealing with is so dangerous. So, for example, um, HIV, what they'll do is they'll have a group that's getting the standard current HIV drug cocktail treatment and then they'll give a different group a different drug cocktail treatment and see what the difference is between the two. Or let's say you're using an insulin for diabetics and then they have a different type of insulin pump for um, a different group and they're trying to measure the standard treatment versus this new way. It's not really a placebo group because you're not giving them nothing because that would be completely unethical. You're giving them something. So uh, placebo is often the control group but not always. Now, keep in mind, a big mistake students make is that they think that a control group is a group that is controlled by the researcher. That's true, but all groups are controlled by the researchers, so that's not what it means. A control group means the baseline treatment group, the group that is being told to do nothing, or the group that is being told to do or being given a placebo, or the group that is being given that standard medical treatment. That's the control group. It's the baseline group, right? It is not the group that is being controlled, quote unquote, by the researcher. Because if you're in an experiment, all the people are being controlled by the researcher. That's not what it means. So a control group is the um, inactive group, the base group, the placebo group, or the standard group, whatever that might be. So for example, in our final exam group, the students that did not get the apple, they are the control group. The students that did get the apple, they're the treatment group. Now it's also important to note that lurking variables, before we leave this page, lurking variables are a big problem in studies. So if you can't control for every confounding variable, then there are always other things, not always, but there are often other things that could be affecting the situation. And that's why in every science class you've ever had, they've told you that correlation is not causation. It's because of those lurking variables that you are not able to have an influence over and you're not able to establish a control group for that create big problems in research. And we're going to talk more about that in chapter four as well and chapter 11. All right, so let's look at example two. This is a real life study, by the way, that I got from a podcast that I love called Revisionist History by Malcolm Gladwell. It has a food scientist wants to compare the flavor of McDonald's fries made with beef tallow, the original method when I was a child, and vegetable oil. They use identical potatoes and cooking times to make the fries. The fries are then numbered and a group of people who don't know which is which, that's very important, that's called blinding. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. Um, test them and rate them on a variety of traits such as flavor, texture, and crispiness, etc. So what are some confounding variables here? Well, confounding variables are variables that could affect what's going on, but that you've measured, taken care of, etc. And the key right here is the identical potatoes and cooking time. See those right there? So I threw that in there to give you an example of a confounding variable. So the confounding variable is the identical potato type and cooking time. Now, were there any lurking variables? Yes. The temperature of the oil, for example, is a lurking variable because we don't know what temperature they had it. Maybe they had the vegetable oil at a higher temperature or a lower temperature. Maybe that was inappropriate. Um, maybe the presentation of the basket somehow influenced what was going on. You can imagine a lot of different things. So I'll just leave temperature of oil. It's, it's a confounding variable that could affect the flavor of the fries that we didn't account for in our particular problem. Now, let's look at what we're looking at, the rating system. The rating system is on a scale of one low to 10 high. That is ordinal and quantitative discrete. Now, it's, it's a really terrible, um, a lot of statisticians don't like this particular type of method of rating um, because 
there's no baseline and so what one person's three is another person's seven etc but nevertheless in real life practice it's treated as quantitative discrete one two three four five and it's ordinal because you know that three is higher than two but you don't really know by how much or what that difference means again a lot of statisticians really do not like the ordinal quantitative discrete um, Likert scale is what it's called from one to ten or one to twenty or whatever um, but nevertheless it's used a lot in practice now, if the researcher finds that beef tallow fries taste or have better flavor, can they conclude that frying in beef tallow causes the fries to taste better? And the answer is no, primarily because of the, the big lurking variable that we were not able to control for. So we know, for example, that we did not account for the fry oil temperature, for example. Um, but if you could control for all of the remaining um, lurking variables, then perhaps a causal claim could be possible in this situation, because this is a pretty easy thing to control for, relatively speaking, as opposed to how students study or sleep before an exam, which would be very difficult to influence all those different variables. But with frying oils and temperatures and, and french fries, it should be possible to control for every possible thing if we are careful, very careful. Another lurking variable I just thought of is actually the amount of salt that was put on the fries. They didn't mention it, so we have no evidence that they actually used the same amount of salt on both batches. So we'd have to be very careful about that as well. Now it is possible to turn these lurking variables into confounding variables that we actually account for in this particular situation. I just wrote it up so that we didn't have them accounted for yet.